Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Jay. Yeah. Very good morning. Today we'll, we'll try to read an Excel file. How an operation can be done against an Excel file, we'll, we'll be seeing. So, Excel is one of the most commonly used applications across any process. And the kind of operations we'll be doing today are I have an Excel file. Call report. Which can say which contains the transaction ID information, the amount of information. What I have to do is I have to run this against the any teller application. So I'll be iterating against the each row. Take the amount value, check whether it's cash or ch check, and then I'll be filling in this information. Once I click on accept. I'll get my transaction information, which I'll write it back to the BID. So this is my set of operations I'll be doing. So first thing I want to do is I want to write uh, write or uh, write read into these operations. So let us have a look at how this can be done. So for Excel related actions, if you look if you type Excel here, all the Excel related actions will be coming. You can see all of them are present here. Excellent actions. My first thing I need to do is I need to launch that Excel. So to launch that Excel, we have something called as Excel scope. So before I start doing that, I have to use a sequence. Let me start doing that. And then let's get into the Excel part. So to first, first step is to launch that Excel file. So Excel application scope is the action we need to use 
for launching Excel. Once you launch that Excel, any operations against Excel should be written within this scope. So you need to specify the group bar to launch that Excel and anything I'm doing against that Excel file should be written within this do scope. So we are doing, so in a way you are saying that all the operations I'm doing are doing on this Excel file. So if you are using multiple Excel files, so that way you will be able to segregate. Okay, in this Excel scope, you are doing any Excel operations that belong to this Excel file that I'm specifying here. If I another scope, the operations I am doing there will be belong to that particular Excel file. So let me give in the path of that Excel file. When I execute this one, you can see that it, it went inside, it launched at Excel, it closed at Excel and came out of the scope as well. Okay, my second thing is to read the data from the Excel. So if I use read range, I'll be able to read the data. Yeah, join one thing here. Uh, here you just have just open the Excel file and uh, you just uh, give a path here only, right? Exactly. Only this uh, we can after uh, running it will go to that Excel file, right? Yeah. But how it will close? It will close automatically or for the moment that? while executing, see what is happening is okay. when the moment it went inside that uh, application scope, it opens. And then once it is done, it close. Once it comes out of the application scope, it will automatically close. So what I'll do to show you how it is working is I'll put a message box in between the blue scope. Now if I execute this one, I paused it here inside the scope and as you can see the Excel file has been opened. The moment I click on OK, it will continue executing and it will come down and it will come out of the scope where you can see the Excel file got closed. Can you see? So whatever Excel related code you are writing should be written inside this do scope because that is when the file will be open. Clear? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to read the data. So we can either read a single cell or we can read the set of cells. To read a single cell, we, I can use read cell. So if I use read cell, for example, I need to specify in which sheet I am reading and what is the cell I am reading. So first I need to get the sheet name. So let me just check what is the sheet name. My sheet name is sheet one only. Let us say that I want to retrieve the first TID number. So all I have to do is run this. So I'm reading the cell sheet one, A1, A2 cell. This is first column, second row, and then storing in the storing that in a variable. So if I want to store this result into a variable that is in the output into a variable. So I, I have two ways of creating a variable. The first option I have is I can click on create variable, specify the variable type or I can right click on this directly 
on this text box and then choose create variable so when i choose that automatically that variable will get created i will create this variable called as cell data the moment i click on it okay no spacing is allowed you can see a variable got created with the variable type generic value because in that cell it could there could be a number there could be a date there could be a text we cannot predict what is present in that excel cell so the data type is generic means it, it could be anything and the scope is do that means that read cell is present within the do scope and the name of that is cell data so what i am doing is i am opening the excel reading this particular cell in this particular sheet and storing that value in the cell underscore data variable okay so if i execute this one it will launch it will read the data and then come out but you don't see that value you're getting read anywhere the reason because we are not throwing this value anywhere i want this value to be seen so i, I can either use message box or you can use read line so what does message box do it will throw that value as a pop-up so that i'll be able to validate whether it is reading correctly or not so message box is some kind of a pop-up so the value I want to be seen is cell data. So now if I execute, it will launch the Excel file, it will read that particular cell, it will throw that value as a message box. You can see 10501. If I open that Excel, the DA2 is 10501 only. And comes out of the do scope, closes the Excel and then ends. So this application scope is like launch and close Excel both together. Return. Yeah, Giant, uh, could you just one more time? Can you see that how to uh, place the value like in a cell? This is reading. You want to tell me to tell you how to write it to a cell? Just, yeah, just I want that how to write means uh, any place a value, put a value. You yeah, yeah, in a uh, Excel yeah, file, just uh, like in one eight or eight three somewhere. Ah, uh, okay, I'm coming to that. So if you want to write, so simple. If you want to write to Excel, you have write cell option. Like how I use read cell to read a cell value. Write cell will be to write into a cell value. Okay. So in sheet one, in eight two, I want to write a cell value. So so see if the initial value is one zero five zero one, I'll replace that with. Uh, 20502 let us say so sheet 1 a2 the text value i want to specify is 10502 this is the value that i want to write into okay so now if i execute this So starting it read the value which is 10501. Now it has written that value right 10502. So if I open the report file, you can see that value got replaced with 10502. That's how you can write back. So read yeah. cell is to read the cell, write back is to write the cell. Clear? Yes. yes. So in this case, we don't need to specify any save or input or something. No, so anything you're doing is automatically save option. You don't have to go and click again and save. Okay. So in the right cell only, it performs right and also it performs save operation as well. Okay. If you want to save as, then you can use save workbook option. So let us say that whatever you have written, you want to work, save that into a new workbook as well. So can you save workbook and in that you can also specify how do you want to save this workbook as clear 
All right. So let's get back to read part. As I said, we can read the whole data as, or we can read a single cell. Uh, so to read a single cell, we were using read cell. To read the whole data, we so we can either again read the whole column. A particular you want to read the first column full, or you want to read a particular row, read row we have, or you want to read a set of values, uh, three columns and two rows. Then you can use read range as well. So you can read a whole column or you can read a whole row or you can read the whole range of data. So depending upon how you want to read, the UiPath has given you all these features. Clear? So for drag and drop read range, I need to specify the sheet. I also need to specify the range. So let us say that I want to read from A1 to C3, that means first column, first row to third column, third row I want to read. Okay, so that red value will be a table. So the table should be stored in a data table. So right click on this and then type as DT. And if I press enter, a variable gets created automatically with the data type data table so data table is a variable which can contain multi which can store multiple values in the format of a table that's the variable type data table it's like a collection all right yeah so now when I execute this one It launches, it reads that range, and then closes. Again, I want to see whether whatever it is reading is correct or not. I want to see that into a pop-up. So I need to use a message box. So if I drag and drop message box, here I need to use DT. The problem we have is, see, in message box, I can only throw strings, a single value, not a whole table. Okay, my DT contains information which is in the format of a table. It is not a string. So I need to convert that data table into a string. That means I want to convert that multiple values in a table into a single string. So how can I do that is, I have an option called as output data table. This output data table converts a data table into a string. So drag and drop that output data table. You can see when you hover this, it writes, it tells, writes a data table as a string or writes a data table to a string using the CSV format. Okay, so this is the only approach where you can convert a data table into a string. The only reason why you are converting a data table to a string is to throw into a message box. Other, another, other reason, there is no other reason for converting it. So, what is the data table you want to convert? DT. What, so, the, the output will be converted to a string, which I cannot store in data table because its variable type is data table. So I need to store that converted string into a different variable of variable type string. So right click on this and then I give something called as DT string. So I'm creating a new variable DT string and in that I am storing the value. So now in the message box, I'll throw in the DT string. So you can see there are no errors now. So let us execute. It will launch the Excel file. 
reads that value, stores that into a data table DT, converts that DT into a string, and finally throws that values into a message box as a single string. You can see type comma amount comma credit type comma one zero five zero two comma five hundred comma. You can see first three rows only it retrieves for first three columns because I specified the range as A one to C three. What is my A1? This is my A1. What is my C3? This is my C3. So only till here. Sorry, this is not C3. Till here only. C3. So only this amount of information it retrieved. What if I want the full data into the in the whole sheet? I don't know how many columns the data will be there, how many rows the data will be there, but I want the whole sheet data because the number of rows can keep keep changing number of columns can keep changing so i need the entire data then what you need to do is you instead of specifying the range here you just specify a blank so when you specify like this that means you are telling to retrieve the whole sheet information you are not giving any range you are telling bring the whole data present in that particular sheet now if you execute this one You can see the whole sheet, how much our data is present in that particular sheet, it, it brought me all that. If I did not specify the range, it will bring the whole sheet's information. Clear? Any questions anyone has? Anything you want me to repeat? So all we did so far is write how to read into SL read from a cell how to read the whole range or how to read a specific range forget about converting that data table into a string or writing into message box i just wanted to show you how the output looks like so i have specified that but eventually you'll understand that also you just need to observe or you just need to learn how to read how to launch an excel file using excel application scope and how to read the cell or how to read a range are you clear on that yeah okay the moment i click on okay it will come out of that excel scope it will execute next steps come out of the excel scope and then closes and then ends okay so now what i want to do see i don't want to convert it into string just to show you i converted so i'm deleting these two actions that is not my actual purpose my actual purpose is that after i read those values I want to iterate through each row. I want to loop through each row, take that cash amount value and write this into this application. So let me open that Excel file again manually. I'll show you how it's done manually and then we'll automate. So for first row, if you take the amount is 500 and the credit type is cash. So what I have to do is I have to go into cash in and then I have to type 500, click on accept and write this transaction ID 752169 into my Excel because that is what I have done and status as success because I am able to successfully do it. Similarly, 2500, the amount is check. So next to this time what I will go is, I will write this value into check. 2500 and then click on accept and write 752170 again success this time minus 1200 cash that means i am withdrawing so i go into withdrawal and in cash i'll specify minus 1200 but there is no cash in my withdrawal so this transaction is a failure I'll write this value as NA not applicable and then I'll write it as failure because in withdrawal there is no cash option. So if you scroll down to the last minus 550 check that means in withdrawal I need to specify the amount as 550 click on accept and then write this transaction here 353006. So something like that. So if it is a plus value you should write that in deposit. If it is minus value, you should write it in withdrawal. 
if it is cash it should write in check cash text box if it is check you should write it in check, check text box so this is how manually i am doing it i want to automate this part into my ui path so you guys understood what the process is how what we should do okay yeah yeah yeah, it is a deposit form, and we have to deposit or withdraw uh, using various yeah. modes like cash in and checks. Exactly. So, uh, keeping the process, I said what it is doing. It's indirectly you are interacting with a Windows based application. You are interacting with a Excel application. You are also not doing a straight linear process, but you are using decisions also. If else decisions, you can see. If amount greater than zero, then write into this text box. If cash type is equal to cash if the credit type is equal to cash if the credit type is equal to check so you are performing some decisional logic and based on the output you are getting you are going and doing certain action it's a simple if else conditions and here looping through each row so you are in it, you're using for loop or for each so you're using loops you're using decisions you're interacting with the windows based application you're interacting with an excel so these are the kind of things that i am trying to tell you how your path can do let us start so first thing i need to do is okay now i am able to retrieve the data and store that into a data table good so i don't need this i am deleting there is no point of keeping unnecessary variables so we we'll talk about scopes a bit so if you remember uh, let me undo whatever i have done and did sorry guys but okay so let me run this again so what it is doing is it is reading the data table converting that data table into a string and then throwing into a message box so here what we have is something called as a scope what do you scope what is scope is how where is that variable applicable for how much is that variable exposed to so if you see here i put this message box inside the do scope means inside the do block that's why it is able to work but what if i remove that and put it outside the do block so if you can see i am trying to put it outside the do block that is outside the excel application scope okay now it gives an error saying the dt string is not declared or it's saying dt string is not present or inaccessible due to its protection level so the protection level set for the dt string is do scope means i can only use this dt string variable inside the do scope the reason because the scope is set to do i want to but i want to use this dt string outside the do as well even after i close the excel i still want to use the data so how can i do it by converting this scope to so click on this scope and then you can choose how much you want to use it so if i choose sequence so i am specifying the scope as sequence means i want the dt string to be applicable to this sequence so inside this sequence i am able to use the dt string now if i bring this out of that sequence again it will say this is not because i brought it outside this sequence scope so i want it to be universally available that is still this sequence so i'll go back to that variable dt string and then choose the third sequence the moment you choose the sequence now this is so here the scope is the sequence only right so the problem we had here is all of the sequences have the names have the single name 
So this is sequence. So for the better purposes, you can rename them. We can call this sequence underscore master. This sequence. Sequence underscore sub. And this is sequence underscore Excel. Yeah, one too many sequences. That is a problem. Uh, yeah, there are many uh, sequences. Uh, not able uh, to so get all these things. Why are doing these things? So I have minimal. I have sequence underscore master. I have sequence underscore Excel. So by the moment you drag and drop an action, right? That action name will be present here. You need to, if you have multiple actions of the same name, you will be getting confused. So all you have to do is whenever you drag and drop an action, give it a unique name so that it will be easy for you to understand the scope. So same here. I have sequence underscore master and sequence underscore Excel now. So my do my DT string if I open, you can see now it is set to sequence underscore master. Means it is applicable inside this whole sequence. Yeah, someone is asking something. What is it? So you can see the sequence underscore master and sequence underscore uh, we have, I mean, there are like multiple sequences. Uh, access has been generated. How it can possible? So how they got generated is when I dragged and dropped an Excel scope inside that Excel scope also a sequence got generated. How did it get generated is the moment I dragged and dropped this outside the do label that came into inside a sequence. So I'll show you how it happened. So I'm minimizing this Excel application scope. I'm dragging and dropping another Excel application scope. Now you don't see a sequence here, right? So anything I am pulling inside the do scope will not have any problem. Okay, so what happened is inside the application scope, in, there is a do, inside the do scope, there is a read range. But the moment I bring, bring this read range just below the do, do scope, and use read range just below do scope. We'll take another one. So if I drag and drop message box just below the do scope, you see a sequence get created because you are creating two things inside an application scope. Automatically a sequence got created because after do there is a message box. It is a sequence. So automatically a sequence got created and inside the sequence there are these two sequence steps. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, Jan, but I'm just not getting understand that why these activities I'm we are doing like uh, means uh, to perform a specific task. You mean the scope? Yeah, no, multiple sequence you are generating and uh, like uh, like adding out of. I'm not generating multiple sequences. Those sequences are getting automatically generated. When I'm creating a set of actions, a sequence gets generated, and those set of actions will automatically built inside that sequence. So if you remember, I created only one sequence in starting. This sequence is automatically generated because I try to create a message box immediately after the do. So you can see whenever I am creating a sequence of steps, another sequence gets creating. So again, when I drag and drop this do out of that, a third sequence set will be created. Sequence one, sequence two, sequence three. So this is built into the view path where when you are creating two two steps one after another, it will be created inside a sequence. It will create a sequence. Inside that sequence, it will create steps. When you are trying to do step A followed by step B, what the view path will do is first it will create a sequence. Inside that, it will keep step A and step B. So whenever you are doing two steps, it always should be within a sequence. That's the rule. So sequence is some, some kind of a scope. Clear?
Are you guys clear? Yeah, Gant. Uh, yeah, yeah. He just performed the entire thing. That so I think uh, we'll be better clear after that because it's a little bit confusing actually. Yeah. So you guys, if you if you guys start practicing this part, right, then you'll understand how the sequence gets generated. Okay. So I know this scope is something that it's not you cannot understand this in day one. Your sole focus is like what is this exposure or what is a scope. So how the sequence gets generated is something that we will get to understand eventually once you start practicing or once you start uh, going through these classes. Obviously, on first class you'll not be able to understand. My sole focus is what is the scope and how can I change this scope variables exposure into different areas. That is my sole focus. Clear? Okay. Yeah. So if you see that variable that I got created is currently present in the do scope, was present in the do scope. So that is the reason why before that variable was able to use inside the do scope only. But now I was able to do it outside the do scope also because I was able to change it from do to a sequence master. So if you put only in, in do, this variable can be used only inside this do block. If I use this variable value anywhere outside the do block, either to write or read wherever, if I use that variable, then it will throw me an error because I am limiting that variable only inside the do block. So by changing the scope, I am able to change its exposure to whole code. So anywhere in the code, I can use that value. Clear? Guys? Clear. OK. It's kind of confusing right now a bit, but, but eventually. Yeah. Uh, you, see, you, eventually you'll get to understand. Don't worry. So I'm deleting this too, doesn't matter. See, same way, uh, just to show you, I specified this one. But anyways, going back, I'm reading the range and I'm storing that into a DT table, if you remember. I'm deleting the other two variables I don't need. I'm reading the range and I'm storing that into DT variable. Now this DT variable is set to scope do. That means only inside this do block I'll be able to use that DT string. So that's something like encapsulation. Get set properties in .NET, but if you are not aware, that's not a problem. But this is some kind of protection level so that outside the code this value is not misused. So by default, any variable you are creating will only be applicable inside that block only. If you want to use that variable value even outside the block, you need to change that scope value to where you want to use. I want to use this anywhere in the code, so I am changing its scope to sequence master. That means anywhere in my master, means the whole code, I'll be able to use it. This is my main sequence, sequence underscore master. Okay, by changing that scope, I am exposing that DT value to throughout the code. Okay, well, yes. now I read the table. I brought the file. Now what I want to do is, so whatever is happening inside is happening. It's inside this application scope. It went, opened that Excel file, read the table, closed that Excel file, came out. Now what to do? What I want to do is now the data table is nothing but set of rows and columns. I want to iterate through each row and do something. Okay. So I want to iterate through each row and then process that into this one. So to iterate, obviously we'll be using loop. I want to loop through each row, get those values and write into this application, right? So to iterate that each row we have for, or for each. You can see here you have data table for each row. So we are iterating through a data table for each row present in the data table, do this, do that, something like that. So drag and drop that for each row in here. So for each row in which data table, data table DT, that is a data table that we are storing it into. 
for each row in data table what you want to do you need to do here so it is going against each row and then inside the body scope you need to specify what you want to do okay so first what i want to do is for each row i want to get the amount and credit type so these are something that your path has to fill so keep them aside anyways for each row get the amount and the credit type okay so in the body if you type data table you get the data table related actions so for each row i want to get the credit type and then amount so what are these called as called they are called row items right this is in this row this is this row item is amount in this row this row item is credit type so we have an option here get row item for each row get the row item okay which row this particular row so you need to either give the column name or column index you need to specify that means in this row which columns value you want i want the second column value so either you can give the column index or you can give the column name amount directly okay so for this particular row i want to retrieve the second column value which is 500 i want to retrieve the third column value which is cash or i want to retrieve the column name i want to retrieve the value whose column name is amount so either you can give the column index that is a column number or if you know the name you can give the column name also directly so if i specify the column index as 1 okay so i'm telling for each row go to this for each row go to this column index 1 retrieve that cell value and throw that into a data item i'll call this as amount amt so i'm creating a new variable amount which is again a generic value because i'm reading cell by cell so it retrieves through each loop goes to each row gets the first column value of that first row throws it into a message box gets the second row first column value throws into a message box gets the so it's looping clear so let us see whether it's coming as expected or not so again to see the answer we need to throw that into a message box so how the column index will be 1 so i think it's two or i think right? index starts from 0 so the first column is 0 second column is 1 so okay i believe so let me just confirm so if i execute this now first it goes inside reads that excel data comes out side of text excel goes inside the each loop you can see 500 the amount if i go back and reopen my excel you can validate whether the first row's value is 500 or not for that amount it is if you click on okay again it's a for loop right it goes to the second column it is 2500 again it loops third one minus 200 so it is rotating through each row with the column index as one and retrieving one cell after the other this is a first loop second time it is going into loop third time it is going into the loop fourth time it is going into the loop every time it is going to the loop and retrieving the column index of 1 so column index 0 1 2 3 4 clear so now it will 1000 so it retrieving through each loop and then retrieving those values once it is done it closed so it is what for each so for each row in this data table get the row item of column index 1 and throw that value into amount as a message box guys clear yeah yeah so for each is like it each row present in that data table similarly 
how i am throwing into an amount i also will throw that credit type as well so my so this time for credit type i don't give the column index because you know understood we can give the column index this time i'll give credit type, column name as credit type so i said right either you can give the column index which is column number if you don't know the name or you can directly give the co column name as well so this time again i'm using get row item Get row item of which row? The row in data table. And I said you can either specify the column, column index, or column name. So this time I am giving the column name as grade type. This case is to so careful. Grade type. Okay. So I'm storing this into a value called as C type. Okay. I cannot use it. I'll use C underscore type. Again, I'm throwing that into a message box to show you how the value will come as. See, for throwing the value into a message box is just for the debugging purposes. Once you are clarity with it, you can delete and proceed forward. Just to validate whether you are getting correct value or not, you are using message boxes. Actually, in development, it's not required because once you are executing, there is no point of having a message box anywhere. So now if I execute this one, See, uh, the row item amount is 500, credit type is cash, amount is 2500, credit type is check. Since there are two message boxes for each one, it is giving first message box is amount, second message box is C type. Okay. So now that you know that values are coming clearly, you do not need these message boxes, so I'm deleting them. So my question is, now writing into this application should be present inside the loop or outside the for loop? Can someone answer? So my next step is to write I think outside the loop. How you want to do it outside the loop? See, so for each row you are iterating and writing this into application. Inside the loop, right? You are taking each row, writing into the application, clicking on the accept button. Again, inside that loop only, for each row you are doing this, right? Clear? You are doing one row at a time. So this should be done inside the loop only. But if I use launch application inside the loop or outside the loop? Outside the loop. Yeah, because you need to launch it only once. The process performing, you need to do it inside the loop, but launch application should be done outside the loop. Okay, so yesterday, if you remember, I have shown you the record option. I said that is the easiest approach, but we will try the tough approach in tomorrow's class. So now that we are able to read the Excel part, how we are going to write after we read the Excel part, how we are going to write to this application, read this transaction number, and write that back to the Excel. So that we will be seeing in tomorrow's class clear so i have you guys installed a path in your machines yeah uh, no not yet yeah just uh, yeah, only register and uh, have to go to the application i think now or we have to see two things you need to do for, for, i'll tell you the steps if you have not done first is install sql server clear 
Okay. From Microsoft, you can get it for free, 2012, 14, 16, anything you can install. Just install SQL Server. Second thing, ensure that you have .NET Framework 4 or 4.5. So okay. try downloading .NET Framework 4, and when you're clicking on install, right, it's a 30 MB, 40 MB file. When you click on install, if the .NET Framework already is present, you'll get an error saying that .NET is already present above this 4.0. If you do not have, it gets automatically installed. So in which the step you need to do is take .NET Framework 4.5, best, best, that is the most stable one. So take .NET Framework 4.5 from Microsoft, download it and try to install. If you already have it, it will throw an error saying it already exists. If you don't have it, it will automatically install. Okay? Yeah. So you need to have .NET Framework 4.5 or above. You need to have SQL Server installed. Then you go to UiPath, download that UiPath executable file after registering. You can download it for free. And then click next, 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 and install. How many people have already installed it? Uh, yeah, I think I have, because initially I have done that a uh, few months ago, but uh, yeah. But after that, okay. I have not used that. Okay, so try to install that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll probably uninstall that and try and install it today so we'll get to the process again okay tomorrow uh, let me know if you have any challenge because i want you guys to practice parallel with me so that i know seeing is one thing and putting uh, hands on something different okay so i'll be giving you the tasks so now that you know a bit on excel how to read uh, from an excel i wanted to give you a task on excel only so that you will be able to understand that's the reason okay okay so that installed today and tomorrow i'll give you a task okay Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jane, how about this SQL Server? Is it like a trial version or? A... No, yes. SQL Server .NET Framework are free by Microsoft. They are lifelong. Free software. Yeah. Uh, yeah, John. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'm just moving to office, so I'm just uh, logging out. So uh, there is one thing you say uh, SQL Server uh, uh, Express Edition or something. Yes, that's the one. Express Edition. 2012, you can install it's free only. Okay. Uh, it, installing just the server, the server is enough or do we need to install the management studio also? It's not required. Management studio, studio is not required. Okay, fine. The server install should suffice. Yeah, yeah, I installed Visual Studio, so by default, I already have .NET Framework. Oh, if, you have, if you have Visual Studio, then you don't have to worry about .NET Framework or SQL, directly install your path. That okay. means part of Visual Studio, you get those installed anyways. Yeah. So if you guys have Visual Studio, you don't have to, you can ignore those first two steps, directly go to your, your path installation. How about this application from any Teller application? Where can we download this? So that part, I, I'll send you guys today, okay? So what you guys need to do is now probably drop in your email IDs in this message chat box. I'll gather and then I'll send you by end of the day, these applications. Okay. okay. So before you I just... Is this provided by UiPath or like it's your own application? It is provided by UiPath only, but for the trainers they are provided, I just pulled it from there, from the trainer portal. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Now let's get and see you in tomorrow's class.